Hey Canucks fans, Matt Barzell signs, Corey Crawford retires, and I'm going to talk about the only part of the Canucks team that still concerns me. I'm Clay Emo, I'm at Canuck Clay on Twitter, I'm at Clay Emo on Instagram, I'm the founder of the GLCPC, the Good Looking Canucks Positivity Club. This is my Canucks take, all in one take. It's Clay's Canucks commentary for Saturday, January the 9th. This is where you get Canucks insight that's positive and timely. I hope you're doing well. Got a lot to get to today, so I'm gonna warn you that I, I will get to the Canucks stuff to about four minutes in or so, but I will mark that in the timestamp down below, so just click on that timestamp, and I'll take you directly to the Canucks talk. But first, I wanna thank everyone who joined me for either all four or at least one of my season previews that I did with um, Hot Take Hockey, John, on Tuesday, with Nick on Wednesday of Twisted Rister. Thursday was Kim, Isles Girl 3, and Friday was Nathan Gravity, and we looked at, in order, the North, the West, the East and the Central Divisions. Wonderful flow to the conversations. It was great uh, collabing with other hockey YouTubers. So make sure you check out those videos if you haven't seen them already. Also, I want to let you know that I won't be doing any Ask Me Anything for a while. I used, used to do those on Sunday, therefore ask for questions on Saturday, i.e. today. But with the Connect season starting, NHL season starting, we're only four sleeps away, which is pretty cool. I think there's going to be plenty of content throughout the season and the Ask Me Anything were really good for off season. So I'm going to park them for a while, but if you want to ask me questions still, just ask me in the comments or better yet, come on the live streams on Monday nights or after every Canucks game that I'm planning to do this season. Okay, two things uh, from the hockey world that I want to talk about first before I get to the Canucks. Number one, Matthew Barzell signs a three-year contract, $21 million, so $7 million AAV, $7 million cap hit. But the, what's interesting about this, well, obviously the Islanders are happy to get their star back and, and sign for the next three years. But what's interesting is the way it was structured in that the first year, the salary is $4 million, the second year is $7 million, the third year is ten. So four, seven, ten adds up to $21 million, seven average, like I said, but four, seven, ten, that's the key. Because in even though they change the rules, it's still going to set up uh, an important um, aspect of his qualifying offer because he'll still be an RFA, restricted free agent, at the end of his three years. Now, under the new rules, this is very important to know. In the summer, the NHL Pat they amended the rule to RFAs and qualifying offers. In the old in the old days, the qualifying offer would have to be a hundred percent of the the final year of the bridge contract, the the short term contract. So under the old rules, this um, his qualifying offer would have to be ten million dollars. But because of people doing things like this, they actually changed the rule. Where now with the uh, under the new CBA. The qualifying offer is either is one of two things. It's the lower of either the final year salary or 120% of the AAV. So again, it's the lower of the final year salary or 120% of the AAV. So in Matthew Barzell's case, the final year of his uh, contract is $10 million, so that's option one, or 120% of the AAV, which is seven million, is 8.4 million. So all to say the qualifying offer for Mar Matthew Barzell will be $8.4 million, uh, less than the $10 million that it would have been under the old rules, but still quite a significant jump. And that's why you see the salary going uh, like it is from four to seven to 10. So that's the first thing you'll see is, is, uh, is Barzell's contract, the way it's set up. Kind of like Brock Besser's, how his was um, set. And his was set last summer, but under the old rules. So Besser, you might remember, his cap is 5.9. But his salary went four, six, then seven and a half. And then under the old rules, then um, he will, his qualifying offer will be at least, it will be seven and a half million dollars, 100% of the third and final year. It's interesting though, I always compare Barzell and Besser and Clayton Keller, the three candidates for the Calder Trophy three seasons ago. And Clayton Keller signed, you guys remember, an eight year deal though. So he went long term. Of course, times were different back then, but he signed an eight-year deal worth $7.15 million a year. And of course, the guys at the top of that draft class, guys like McDavid, Eichel, and Mitch Marner all um, signed long-term contracts. Uh, McDavid and Eichel signed eight-year deals with their respective teams. And then I think Marner did a six-year uh, six deal. So all to say, those were the long-term deals, whereas Besser and now Matthew Barzell doing bridge deals. Also, this is going to go way longer than four minutes, I just realized. The other one I want to talk about really quickly is Corey Crawford announced his retirement today. So after being let go by the Chicago Blackhawks, signed a two-year deal with the New Jersey Devils. 
but ended up not playing a game for them. And you kind of tell, I, I saw an interview with him at the end of the year and he didn't, he even said, this is hard. It's a hard transition. I, I'm not used to this place, but hopefully the, it'll work. And then he missed five days of practices and announced his retirement today. Obviously a wonderful career highlighted by two Stanley Cup winning, uh, two Stanley Cup championships. You know, uh, as Canucks fans, we'll always remember, well, not always, we'll remember him as the goaltender in the net when when Burl scored to slay the dragon. But that was Corey Crawford's rookie year, and that certainly wasn't his fault. That was a weird shot, right, with the puck on end. And I, I think it was, a, it was a broken play. Campoli couldn't clear the zone, all those things. We know all that kind of stuff. But I'm not here to rag on Corey Crawford. I actually thought he was, a, I think, I, I thought he was a really good goalie, um, good, um, you know, a really good team guy, competitive, but you never saw him losing his temper. You never saw him talking bad in the media. Just a classy guy. So uh, we wish Corey Crawford, uh, obviously his play dropped off a little bit last couple of years, but we wish him all the best. And um, I, I trust that this was a really good um, decision for him and his family. Okay, now we're six minutes in, but let's talk about the Vancouver Canucks. They, they had uh, scrimmages, not scrimmages, they had practices this morning, skates this morning, but it was close to the media actually. But then they're having a scrimmage tonight and that it will be actually live stream on Canucks dot com likely through their youtube channel and i'm not sure how they're going to break up the scrimmage because we know that um in in the two groups they've had basically a, a pro group that, that i talked about yesterday the the 23 guys that will likely make the roster maybe with one or two changes and then they had the the second group who are either taxi squad utica guys or guys can go back to junior teams whatever it may be so i'm not sure how they're going to split it up i i they must I'm sure they're going to split them up a little bit to make it more even. Otherwise, I think one team should schlack the other team. Um, so I'll report on that scrimmage tomorrow as part of my vlog. But for today, to talk about the Canucks, I want to talk about where I think the weakest part of the team is. And, you know, you can look at top six, bottom six, defense, or goaltending. And all of them were affected by the changes but I really think that, the, especially the Travis Hamannick signing and the emergence of Niels Hoglander, I've talked about both things at length this week. Those are going to beef up the, those two respective places. So I'm not worried about our top six at all. We have the lotto line. We have steady Horvat and Pearson. And maybe an emerging, surprising Niels Hoglander, who I've spoken about at length this week. So top six is fine. I think our D is much stronger than last year. I think our D is the strongest it's been in a long while because I think uh, Nate Schmidt will be a revelation to us. Bonafide number two, as I talked about yesterday. So you got Hughes, Schmidt, Edler, Myers, Ole Olevi, who looks like he's ready to step up, and Travis Hamanek, um, who, who can't play for a couple more days but or can't skate. But he is going to be, um, I think, a really welcome addition as well. And then, uh, you know, without him, the death drops off a little bit with Jordy Ben and then Rafferty and Chatfield. But with Hamannick, that's a solid top six of Edler, Schmidt, Myers, Hughes, Hamannick, and Yolevi with Ben and Rafferty waiting in the, and Chatfield waiting in the wings. So I'm not worried about our, our blue line. I'm not worried about our goaltending. Demko's Demko, same guy as yet last year with with some increased confidence because of his playoff experience. And I, I just have a really strong feeling that Brayden Holtby is going to bounce back. He's a former Santa Cup winner, Vesna winner. Um, so I'm not worried about Brayden Holtby at all. So that leaves the bottom six. And if you look at the lines from yesterday, it was the exact same bottom six that we wound up the season with, the regular season with at least, with Adam Gaudet between Roussel and Vertanen on his wings on the third line. And then Jay Beagle centering Tyler Mott and Brandon Sutter on the fourth line. Now, when you look at those, so this is a concern to me. When you look at those players themselves, they all have good attributes to them. And I think Tyler Mott is the one who I, I really grown to like a lot with his hustle, with his good defensive play, his penalty killing, and his fearlessness. We know Jake Vertanen is very polarizing. We want him to, we want him to do well, um, but he just hasn't gotten there yet. Anton, Anton Roussel had a bad season last season. But, um, you know, he admitted that he came back from his knee injury too quickly. Gaudet, we're not sold on yet. We want him to be good. We want him to be a penalty killer. We, want, we know he's got offensive skill, um, but can he put it all together, including the face-off circle? And then Beagle and Sutter, veterans, leadership, but kind of redundant. Almost, they almost do the same thing. Good penalty killers, good in the face-off circle, but get caved when it comes to five on five. And then on the outside looking in, you know, Zach McEwen, or maybe he won't be on the outside looking in. A lot of young potential, but we don't know what's there yet his complete game, and then Louis Erickson, and we don't have to talk too much about him. So I don't know, of those eight guys, which it sounds like those are the eight guys they're going to go with, 
what's your ideal combo? What is your ideal combo? Because we saw at the start of training camp that actually it was interesting. They mixed those guys up where it was Brandon Sutter going back to the middle between Mott and Vertanen. And then the fourth line of Gaudette between uh, McEwen and Roussel. And that left Erickson on the outside looking in, but Jay Beagle on the outside looking in. And to me, those two lines seem more intriguing than the what we ended up the season with last year. So this is something we need to track through the last the last half of the training camp. And maybe Travis Green will go back to what he started training camp with, in that is Mott and Vertanen on the third line with Sutter. I actually like that a lot. Sutter's not the best playmaker, but on the wings, you have a lot of speed now with Mott and Vertanen. And a fourth line where you have Gaudet, uh, he can play sheltered minutes. And then he's got, uh, you know, he's got Zach McEwen, some speed and size, more size than speed, I guess. And then Anton Roussel, kind of a pest. And that's kind of what you want in your fourth line or third line, but you definitely want in your fourth line. And then that would mean, though, that Jay Beagle's out and Louis Erickson's out. I don't think we have to talk about Louis. But with Jay Beagle, you lose some leadership. You lose some penalty killing. But um, like I said, are Beagle and Sutter too redundant of a, of a player? So we'll see. Uh, obviously, the, the biggest thing with the bottom six is those guys need to be penalty killers. And then in the in the iteration that I want, who would your penalty killers be? Well, Mott's still in the lineup. Sutter's still in the lineup. And then you'd have to find penalty killers out of Gaudet, Roussel, McEwen, or Vertanen. Or do you pull from uh, Pearson or JT Miller who have done it before? And then that's that's the only disadvantage you have if you have both Erickson and Beagle out. You, you could argue those are two of your best four penalty killers, um, you know, when it comes to forward. So a lot of things to think about. Maybe we'll get some clarity over the next few days. But that's what I wanted to post to you, Canucks fans, is um, how do you think the bottom six should be shaped? And are you concerned about the bottom six? And do you agree with my assertion that between top six, bottom six, blue line, and goaltending, that of those four aspects, the bottom six is still the biggest concern on this team. And if so, how would you fix it with the guys we have right now? Leave a comment below. I'd love to read, react, and reply. As always, subscribe if you like to. Like this video if you like to. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, and take care of each other. Enjoy the weekend. God bless, and go Canucks go.